That was wonderful. So tonight, I want to give you a snapshot at what we did during camp. We had our camp this week. Uh, we had 20 students, 14 staff members, three days of lives being changed. I found out that I'm not 20 anymore. Every morning I'd wake up and be reminded of that. Well, we found out as a group that our students are under attack. And we are under attack in this world. So the first thing that the students had to realize as we walked through all of our lessons was that we're at war. And a good warrior needs to be prepared. They need to have armor. And so last week we talked a lot about the armor of God. Now you can picture it in your mind what a knight would look like with all the armor on. And I did a lot of studying. Jack, you don't know. I did so much studying preparing for that uh, camp and then also for this lesson that I thought about armor a lot. What armor means, what it does. And I began to have dreams at night about armor. I dreamt about a horse covered head to toe in armor, solid metal running, and it would wake me up at night. It would pull me out of a deep sleep, and I would be panicked. And I would look at Christy, and Christy said, well, just go to bed, it's probably a nightmare. <laughs> Forgive me for that one, but I couldn't resist. Will you join me in praying? For victory in this war. Let's pray together. Father, all of us are in a battle, whether we know it or not. The front lines are right outside our doors. See, we're safe in here in the church, we think. We think in here, everything is perfect. We can have uh, communion, one with you. We can have special time together. But God, as soon as we cross the threshold of that door, we're back out there in the world, back in the battlefront. So, Lord, we need victory. I ask that you show your people today how they can not only be prepared, but assured of the victory that you will provide. Because, God, you're going to do it. And we can't wait to be part of it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey, will you open your Bibles tonight to Ephesians chapter 6? Uh, we're going to be looking at verses roughly 10 to 17, talking about the armor of God. If you didn't bring your Bible, no worries. I will put it on the screen for those of you that are watching online. It'll pop right up there on your screen. You'll have access to it. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17 lays out what each piece is. So what I'd like to do tonight is go through all the pieces... And then we'll go back and we'll pick this apart and try to understand, why do we need each piece? Why did God include that in Scripture? Because when I go outside, I'm not seeing a lot of people wearing armor. I'm not seeing a lot of people wearing, you know, the helmets and all those kinds of things. But they're still there. Okay, let's take a look at this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. What's interesting about that is, take a look at that on your screen here, up on, the, up on the board. What's it say? It says, be strong in the Lord. Okay, I can do that. That, that tells me to have a little courage because of God. I'm, I can do that. But it doesn't say you're going to be strong because of you. What's it say? Be strong because of Him. Do you see that? It is the power of His might that gives us strength. If you don't have the belief in your life that He is who He is, who He says He is, you're not going to have that strength. You need to have the strength because of Him. It's His power. We are stronger because we lean on Him. 
And so this past week, we talked a lot about that with our students, about how they've got a lot of pressures on them. They've got things that are dragging them down. They're dealing with heavy things, and they can't do it alone. And they don't often want to come to mom and dad for help, so they look other places. But I told them, if they just lean on God and let God do it, it'll get taken care of. See, we lean on Him and in the power of His might. Let's look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. That's a very strange word. We don't often use wiles. It's also in some translations, it's schemes. And what it really is, is a Greek word, methodia. Methodia. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like method, doesn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. It is the method or the attacks the tactics of the attacks. It's not necessarily you're wearing armor to protect against the attack itself. That's one thing. But when you look at that, Methodia says you're going to prevent attacks from multiple vectors. You see, uh, in cybersecurity, we focus on multiple attack vectors. What does that mean? Well, that means that someone could send you an email saying, Click here and see this. And when you click it, it infects your computer. So that's an email. Someone else could go to a website and download a little Trojan uh, virus that will infect your system. There's multiple ways that this can happen. Multiple attack vectors. This is nothing new. This is something Satan knows well. He needs multiple attack vectors to get you. Because when you're attacked, a lot of times you build up an immunity or you put up a wall to prevent that attack, right? You only get slapped so many times before you start putting your hands up to stop it. But that leaves your legs vulnerable and someone can kick you in the shins. There's multiple different ways that you're going to be attacked. That's what that verse says. Wiles isn't something, you know, uh, really dogmatic and, and a lot of doctrine behind it. It literally is strategy. It's, it's the way he's going to attack you. Because the way he attacks John is not the way that he attacks Mandy, and not the way that he attacks Emma, and not the way he attacks Pastor Rodney. He's got a specific way to attack all of us. But what's that verse say? Look at that one more time. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You need all of this armor. Verse 12 continues what's going on. Let's take a look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We get so caught up in trying to understand what we're fighting against. What does the word principalities mean? What does the word rulers of darkness mean? Don't get caught up in that. Here's what you need to know. If you're attacked by a human attacker, what can you do? If Rick was here, he could tell you exactly what he could do. That attack would stop, right? And there would be no more attack after the attack was stopped. But what we need to know about this is our attacker is not human. So there's nothing that I can do to stop additional attacks. Does that make sense? The attacks just keep coming. And they're going to come. And they're going to come. And I think I've got this. I've protected this area of my life. I'm sure that I'm not going to get attacked. And if, I'm, if I do, I'm ready to block it. I'm good. I'm good right here. Oh, no. There's that other attack vector. Yeah. That's what that verse is talking about. 
you have to take up that whole armor of God. That's what verse 13 talks about. Look at verse 13 here. Verse 13 says, therefore, because of that, because, because there's so many different vectors, because uh, of the fact that you're fighting not a human enemy, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Notice, notice that it's whole. It's the whole armor because you're not effective without all of it. You're not effective without all of it. We, we talked a lot about this with, with the students over there. If I put on my, my chest plate and I put on my helmet and I'm ready to go and I walk outside with no shoes on, how effective am I going to be? You know, I don't know if you've ever been to the beach and walked in hot sand, but I'll tell you what, it'll change your life. If you walk outside with no shoes on and walk on that beautiful new hot macadam out there, yeah, you'll leave footprints or skin prints if it's hot enough. If you don't have everything taken care of, you're going to be ineffective. So that verse says, put on the whole armor of God. We're very good at per putting on the part we like. There's a part that we just love. It's different for everybody. But that armor that I'm really drawn to, I'll put that on every day. I won't ever forget it. But that other one, it's a little heavy. Don't really like it. Won't let me do what I want to do. So I'll let that one off. This verse says you are ineffective in the fight. You're more vulnerable. There's parts of your life that are vulnerable. You need to strengthen those parts of your life. And once you strengthen them, then you can stand. Wait a minute. I thought we were in a war. It's a battle. Then you can fight. Is that what the verse says? You could stand. Yeah. It never says that you have to fight. It says, just stand. Remember, if you lean on Christ, He's got this. You just stand up. You suit up and you get ready and let Him do the heavy lifting. He'll do the hard work. So stand. In fact, Stand therefore, the next verse says, having girded your waist with truth. Now we're going to get into what the different parts of that armor is. Girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So what is that telling us? It's telling us the first thing we have to do is suit up. Suit up first. The first thing you should do every morning before leaving your home is suit up. If you don't get dressed before you leave the house in the morning, someone's going to notice. You don't want that someone to be Satan when he looks at you and says, Ha ha, there's a vulnerability I can exploit. Let me get in there and mess up this person's life. So first we have to suit up, then comes the victory. So let's learn how to suit up. Again, Ephesians chapter 6 talks all about this suit. All the different pieces, you can see them there. Here's the helmet. The belt, the shield, the shoes, the sword, and the breastplate. All of those pieces are required and are necessary. The very first piece we're going to talk about is what it says there, gird your waist with truth. Some translations will say you wear the belt of truth. It's important to know what you believe. And to have a firm foundation in what you believe is true. Now, let me ask you a question. By the way, kids got this very easy. What is the opposite of truth? Lies. Exactly. So this belt of truth 
helps us against the father of lies, who is Satan. That's really it. This belt of truth is necessary because it's the truth that helps us spot the lies. We talked a lot uh, all throughout sermons about how to understand what's counterfeit. You guys remember that, right? Everybody, you guys at home remember that. The way the Secret Service understand what's a counterfeit is not by understanding all the different ways that money can be counterfeited. It's by to study the real thing. Study it hard so you know it frontwards and backwards and sideways so that when you spot something that doesn't look like it, you know it's a fake. It's that way with counterfeit money, even with knockoff things. I mean, anybody ever buy a, a knockoff purse or a wallet or, or a whatever? Yeah. You're going in thinking you're getting a Vera Bradley, and you end up buying a Velma Brady. It's nothing like it. It falls apart, but it looks the same. Understanding what is true is important. You've got to have that belt of truth on. Now, I, I want to show you a little bit about what this belt may have looked like in Jesus' time. So you could say this belt, it was actually a leather belt that was tied around a wool tunic. And then these pieces here hung down on the front and they actually had bronze plates on them to protect the groin area when they were fighting so that if a, if a sword would happen to come down, it wouldn't take out the soldier. And it's also here, it, this holds all of the, uh, the tools, the swords, the things like that. And... Uh, it, it's worn all the time, not just during battle. They wear this all the time. Why? I don't know if you know this, but those dresses, those tunics they wear, they don't come with pockets. There's no place to hang anything on those. So they use your belt to hang things. And so when we, when we look at that, we can understand that truth is important. See, most people will argue and say, well, the Bible means different things to different people. And that's true. It does. There are people out there that have a completely different take on the Bible. But God meant only one thing when He inspired it. And that's what we need to lean on, what we need to, to hold fast to. If we look at, at John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says what? Jesus says, I am the way and the, say it, truth, yes, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So this truth that we put on, this belt of truth, is like Jesus. He's the truth. Will help us to understand. And that's a big thing, because the truth is not something, it's rather someone. We don't think about the belt of truth. That helps us to not tell lies. No, that's Wonder Woman's lasso that does that. The belt of truth is something, uh, it is someone rather than something. Jesus is truth. Christ wants you to wear truth. Satan wants you to wear lies. He wants you to believe the lies. The second purpose really for a belt is what? To hold your pants up, right? You can't fight if your pants fall down. You certainly can't run. But also, remember, it was holding all those tools. Think about a policeman. What does he have on his belt? All sorts of stuff, right? Yeah. Batman. He had everything on his belt. You name it, he had everything. Even as an EMT, I wore a belt. I had all kinds of stuff. I had a radio, I had a pocket mask, some gloves. I got a whole snicker compartment back here if I got hungry. Yeah, I had it all. My belt held all my tools. Jesus is the tool that we need. When someone's hurting, what tool do I need? They need Jesus. When someone's angry and they can't take it anymore, what tool do I need? They need Jesus. It's very simple. He's like a multi-tool. It can do anything. Truth is not something, it's someone, and that someone is Jesus. Truth is the tool that we use to combat the lies of the enemy. So we got to have that belt. We need that belt of truth. But 
We all can tell a suit of armor by the chest plate, right? The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is vital to Christians. But what really does righteousness mean? What does it mean? It means several. I, I can remember years ago when, when righteous meant it was something cool. You would watch the surfers and they would go, righteous! Things like that. That's, that's not it. That's an improper translation. I want to show you what that verse actually means. The, the word righteous is dikeosune. And the root word of that is dikea, which means justice. So this dikeosune for righteousness means justice. It means loyalty. It can mean trustworthiness, consistency, equity, what is right, honesty, community. The, all these things are packaged up in that word righteousness. So you say, there is a righteous man. He would have, or woman, it ha, would, have, would have to fall into this category. They would have to be honest. They would have to be all of these things. They would have to have a, a, a good well-being, a, a, a good decision, good judgment. This is the kind of person you could look at and say, they are righteous. But let's take a quick peek at that uh, that breastplate, what it might look like. So this was iron and bronze scaled armor. It was built in four sections and it was used to cover the shoulders and the sides of the chest. And then there was a chest plate piece put in. So on the sides, down here, and then the chest plate was sewn in. It was like a, a leather vest that was put on like a jacket. And then the last piece was put on and it was tied. That's in our minds, we think of the knight in shining armor, this like complete, completely encapsulated one piece of... No, that's not what Jesus was saying. He was not saying King Arthur's knight. He's talking about this guy. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone came at me with a knife or something, I would much rather have that full shiny metal, you know, King Arthur type armor than... Uh, a metal plate tied with leather to it. See, there's too many holes there, too many opportunities for us to have a problem. And that word again, the dikeosune, justice, righteousness, it should be a part of who we are. We're called to be righteous people. And we have to understand who we are. If you don't understand who you are, you can get into a lot of trouble. You see, if a bear doesn't know he's a bear, he won't hibernate, right? If a fish doesn't know that he's a fish, he might try living in the desert. That won't work out well for him. A breastplate covers our heart. It covers our heart. And see, righteousness, this breastplate of righteousness, in covering our heart, it covers our testimony. You see, when we have problems with our heart and we do things that maybe we shouldn't do, that hurts our testimony. We are less righteous for having done them, and we're called to put on the breastplate of righteousness every single day. That sounds kind of hard, Pastor Rodney. I don't think I'd like to do that. Can I just put on that belt? Sure. Let's just see how good you are against arrows. Lift your little belt up and see if you can stop an arrow. It's not going to happen. We need to have righteousness as well. The next part of the, uh, the armor of God is actually the sandals shod your feet with the gospel of peace. This is what they, they really look like. In here, they would put little bits of metal and little bits of rock for some traction and then they were just laced up and tied. And here's the cool thing. As they were marched in or fought in, they would actually conform better, because they were leather, to your feet and become a better fitting, feeling pair of shoes over the time that you wear them. Does that make sense? Anybody that's ever had New Balance 
just said amen, because I know those things are comfy, right? Okay, listen, what's important about this is when you put them on the first time, they hurt a little bit. Anybody ever put new shoes on? Yeah? They're, they could even give you blisters walking in them. But over time, what happens? They loosen up, and before long, you don't want to give them up. Even when there's holes all through them and your wife's saying, please, throw those away. They've got holes all, but they're so comfortable. I love these shoes. Look, that's the gospel of peace. This, this shoes represents the gospel. When we first start out, the gospel can be harsh, can it? It can rub people the wrong way and cause blisters and, and disrupt your family and make some people angry and uncomfortable and it could hurt. But over time, as you walk with Jesus, those, the gospel message, it conforms a little bit to you and it feels a little better on you. And then you're able to not only live out the gospel, but tell others about the gospel as well. So think about these shoes for just a minute. What types of shoes do you need? What, why would we wear different shoes? Why doesn't everybody have the same type of shoes on? Now I'm not talking about the brand, but shoes help keep your feet warm and dry, right? If it is snowing out and there's three feet of snow, and you go out there with your flip-flops or your sandals or your Crocs or your whatever you're wearing for summertime, your feet are going to get cold and wet. You see, shoes also allow you to go places that are unsafe, places that you normally wouldn't go. You could put those shoes on and go. Whether there's glass out there, whether there is rocks out there, I remember as a kid having to get out of a swimming pool and you walk across gravel and he's out, out like that. And then I realized if I ran really fast, I would hit less stones and it wouldn't hurt as bad. If I had my shoes on, I could have went anywhere with no problem. I could have taken my time. You see, the gospel of peace allows you to go anywhere. It'll allow you to take that message someplace where you'd never really go, where you'd never want to go. It'll allow you to do that. Now, shoes don't just do that. They don't just allow you to go where, where you, you don't normally go or where it was unsafe to go, but they help you to do things better. Anybody ever play sports? I know Ron did. What's those special kind of shoes that you wear when you play sports? What do they have? Cleats, what's the purpose of those? So you can dig in a little bit? So you can turn sharper? So you can run faster? Yeah, those are shoes that actually make you better at doing the thing you're doing. The gospel can make you better at doing your everyday duties. The everyday things that you do day to day can be better because of that. You can move faster. Same kind of thing. If you were dropped into the ocean, what kind of shoes would you like to have on? How about flippers? You could really swim fast, right? They wouldn't do anything in the snow for you, I don't think. And slippers wouldn't do any good for you in, in the water. But the purpose of those different kinds of shoes are to help you move faster, to take you to places that you were unable to go. But like I said before, being a Christian is not about fighting. Even though it's a battle, it's about peace. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's all about peace. <laughs> Hold up, you just lost me. You started with armor, then you said it's a battle, and it's a battle for peace? Yeah, that's how God rolls. It's completely countercultural. It's, it's completely opposite of what you might think. The battle is through peace. Satan wants you to wear strife. 
He wants you to wear turmoil. He wants you to wear fighting. God says, stick on my peace shoes. That's what you need. And when we look at the next verse, it says, Above all, have on the shield of faith. Let me tell you a little bit about this shield. So a shield was curved. It's not like the round Captain America type of shield that we sometimes have in our minds. It's made so they could interlock with others. And uh, because it's curved, we can step right up in it. And it's movable. I can lift it up. I can move it down side to side. If the attack's coming this way, I can slide it around to my side to prevent an attack. You see, it's movable for one main reason. Because that armor that I put on, it's not sealed. There are gaps in that armor. You remember how the, the shoulders went on and the sides went on and then the breastplate came on afterwards and then they were tied with leather straps? Well, there's gaps in our armor. Satan's not dumb. He's going to look for the gap in your armor. And if he can find that gap to get something in, maybe it's a thought, maybe it's a situation, he knows what makes you angry. He knows what will cause you to sin. And that's what he's going to use. So what do the soldiers do when something's coming towards their gap? They turn their shield up, down, and remember how I said they interlock? That's right. When two soldiers are beside each other, those two shields come together and they lock. And the more soldiers you have, you can actually form a circle around you and even above you to prevent attacks from the top. So the more, more believers that you partner with, the more believers that are, that are a part of your inner circle, the better protected that you all are against attacks. Because while I'm facing this, and this attack's coming, and I'm focused on that, the other attack vector is open. He's got it. As I'm standing here having this problem, John comes up and he puts his shield up. And Boots is behind me, and she puts hers up. And I'm safe. We work together. You see, the shield of faith is important because we have faith in God. Because He is God. And He can't be just God when good things happen. And then when bad things happen, we get upset. And we're angry with God. We need faith in tough times above all else. Have that shield of faith. And it says that you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's what he's doing. He's aiming for those gaps and launching fiery darts. These attack uh, things to attack us every single day. The next two pieces, we're almost done. The next piece is the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet of salvation, the iron helmet was forged from one piece of metal, and it has leather crests on it. And the crests are made of dyed horse hair up top, and that indicates their rank. And then we've got plates that hang down on each side and then in the back to cover the neck and the shoulders. So the, he the helmet just didn't take care of the head. It, it took care of the whole neck area and then signaled to others who you were. helmet of salvation is important because it is the helmet of salvation to always remember that you're saved forever if you've asked jesus into your heart into your life and you've turned your life over to him you can't take the helmet off it's stuck it's super glued on you can take confidence in that and you can live in it and the very minute you're saved Hey, if you've, if you've not listened to anything else, I want you to listen to this. This is important. The very minute that you're saved, that you say, Jesus, I want you to take over my life, Satan spends the rest of your life 
trying to convince you otherwise. He's going to have you doubt your salvation. He's going to have you think about something and then think, you know what, someone who was a Christian who was saved wouldn't think that way. Someone who is, is really saved, for real, wouldn't have that problem. He's going to spend the rest of your life trying to tell you that you're not saved. So, why is it important for our head to be protected? Because that's where sin starts. Cain killed Abel, right? How did he do it? Well, you know, he hit him with a rock. So did it start when he picked up the rock? Or did, he start, maybe, did it start when he hit it? No. How about when he picked up the rock? No. How about when he thought about it? Sin starts here before it gets here. Does that make sense? We need to protect our heads with that helmet of salvation. We need to protect it. And uh, the last piece I want to talk about is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. So the sword was carried at the right side, hung from the belt or leather strap, and then over the shoulder as well. And uh, it was a powerful offensive weapon in the hand of a skilled soldier. And it was very, very deadly if swung accurately. The, the verse says that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. We know that. We've always been taught that the sword of the Spirit is the Bible. And that's true. That's true. But I want, you know me, I want to go deeper. I want to dig a little deeper. I want to get down in there and try to pull apart and see what it was really like then so I can completely understand this. In the Greek, there are two different words that are translated word. The first one is the word logos. And that is your written word of your Bible. Right? John 1, 1, in the beginning was... That's this one. The word. The written word. The Bible. The scriptures. This... Spirit, this, this sword of the Spirit, it says it's the Word. That Word is this, Rhema. And Rhema is the spoken Word. It's out loud. It is the sword of the Spirit because the Spirit is the one that gives you the interpretation of the Logos and becomes the Rhema in your mind and in your ears. But then also, the power comes when you take that written word and you use it as the sword to defend or to whatever when it comes out of your mouth. The rhema, spoken word of God. Does that make sense? When you are quoting Scripture... It is that rhema, spoken word. It is important to read the word logos. It is of great importance to listen for the Holy Spirit, the rhema. Remember all of those different parts of the armor? There were six total. There were five defensive, one offensive. What does that tell you? Anybody with kids has, has said, you have two ears and one mouth. What does that mean? You should listen twice as much as you talk, right? Same thing here. What does that tell us? Five defensive, one offensive. The battle is not for you to fight. The battle is for you to stand. That's why I'm giving you five things to protect yourself and keep yourself safe while you're standing in the battle. We're in the battle, but it's not ours to fight. It says so we can stand in the evil day, not fight in the evil day. Jehoshaphat was, was afraid in 2 Chronicles 20, verses 15, and, and this is what it says. 
And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but whose? God's. The battle's God's. Battle is God's. Don't believe me? Still don't believe me? Okay. Why not look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 47. This assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. That was David and Goliath. This is David telling them, the battle's God's, and so is the victory. So what are we supposed to do? What do we do on a daily basis? Well, here's something we can do. If we look at Proverbs 21, 31, it says, The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but the deliverance is of the Lord. All we have to do is be prepared, and He will do the delivering. Amen? Amen. Some of us need a victory. Some of us need a win. Even if it's something small, we just need something because, you know, we're going through such hard times in our lives that we're, we feel like we're drowning, like we can't stay, stay afloat. Jesus' name is victory. He is our victory. And for our closing song tonight, I'm going to play a video about victory. It's a great song, and I, you, you can read it down below or just sit there and listen, and I want you to think about how Jesus is the victory. So will you pray with me as we close? Father, we're about to listen to this final song, and God, you, you have shown us that ours is not to fight the battle, but just stand. Just stand and be ready. So I ask that your people here will be ready that they'll put on the full armor of God so they can stand against the schemes, the wiles, the attack vectors of the devil because he's not going to stop until we're destroyed. And you're not going to stop until he realizes that what he's doing is futile because you have won. It's set in stone. You have the victory. God asks for a blessing as each person as they leave tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.